Hello everybody and good afternoon. This is Mahmoud Etemaddar and I'm going to present the second part of my presentation about concept selection for deep water field development planning. Actually this second part is recreated again because uh, it was a limited time on uh, January 26 and we just mm, quickly uh, went through it uh, and maybe you, you didn't capture all the topics uh, properly okay now let's begin now the second part is about surface facility team and their task which is actually concept selection and concept screening concept screening and concept selection process which is the main task of surface facility team let's make a review first as we mentioned earlier, concept selection is a subset of field development planning. Exploration and appraisal phase provide required information for concept selection, and success of concept selection phase highly depend on the quality of the data provided in the previous phases. In fact, subsurface drilling and completion team provide multiple depletion scenarios including well count, location and types, drilling and work cover and well intervention requirements, associated production profile, fluid composition, recovery method, dry tree versus wet tree requirement, well intervention methods and frequency and drilling requirement during production. And based on these depletion scenarios as an input surface facility will generate corresponding development scenarios including field subsea architecture host units which includes hull type mooring and riser system work cover and well intervention packages and export system beside these two groups uh, commercial and management team will calculate net present value, net present investment and risk assessment. Actually, commercial and management team uh, is not necessarily a separated group. It can be some of the persons or employees in both of these groups who are taking over these responsibilities mainly. But why we divide it into concept screening and concept selection process and what are the differences? So if we want to make a simple comparison between concept selection and concept screening, we can say that for definition, um, concept screening requires that uh, concepts defined into prime, up to primary system levels. But for concept selection, concepts should be defined in more detail, which is known as basic design, which can be a, something uh, like a pre-feed. For cost estimation, cost estimation for concept screening can be um, very rough, rough cost estimation I mean. So it is known as class 5 but for concept selection you need more accurate cost estimation. For risk assessment, during concept screening risk assessment is optional but for concept selection risk assessment is mandatory to finalize the solution and concept. In respect to qualitative ranking, for concept screening, qualitative ranking up to attribute level is sufficient. But for concept selection, we should go even further down to sub-attributes, which will be explained later with, and we will show with some examples. And stochastic analysis. For concept screening is mandatory. Why? Because there is high uncertainty in our calculation in this step or in this phase. And for concept selection is optional. Actually, both of these phases use uh, using similar process, but their main difference is in the accuracy and level of implementation. How we start concept screening and concept selection phase? Usually it starts with a facility flaming workshop with representative from all stakeholders early in the selection phase. The purpose of this workshop as you can see here is first to establish 
the objective of the project then strategies to reach this objective and then establish design basis document and functional requirements and generate a concept development matrix based on functional requirement and design basis and finally generate development scenarios which will be compared and rank uh, with uh, some decision drivers and ranking methodologies which will be developed later now we'll explain main step for concept screening and concept selection so the input to the concept screening and concept selection phase is field depletion scenarios the first step is to establish basis of design and functional requirements and establish ranking criteria and methodology and identify building blocks from proper technologies and now we can start first a stage of concept selection which is known as concept screening which we need first a stage definition I mean we should define the concepts up to the level which is sufficient for this concept screening phase and then we combine building blocks to generate different development scenarios let's say for example 10 to 80 scenarios but this is just a relative, some relative numbers to show that in this phase or this, this step we generate quite a lot of different scenarios and actually we are identifying all the possible scenarios and then we rank these scenarios by compare them together to reduce them to 5 to 10 scenarios sufficient for concept selection phase in concept selection again we need another stage of definition which we should define our concept in more detail and then again we rank and compare scenarios to finalize concept but if we cannot make a final decision for example we end up with two, uh, two concepts what should we do we go to another step which we use tie breakers and operator strategies to final decision and after that we should compare our final decision with international experience by international benchmarking I mean we just compare uh, the solution we have end up with the solutions other companies or other operators in, in different part of the world have been using for the similar field and now if it is uh, approved we can go to the concept definition phase and send it for fit phase I mean so as we mentioned it is a two-step process first concept screening and then concept selection the main objective of concepts screening is to identify all possible solutions all the possible solutions so it can be even more than 80 it can be even reached to 140 150 solution as we will see later and then make some technical feasibilities to just select technical solutions and then make economical ev uh, evaluation with rough cost estimation which is known as cost class 5 and reduce the number of scenarios to 5 to 10 for concept selection phase and sometimes based on our field characteristic the number of wells production wells I mean can be one of the decision parameters or optimization parameters in concept selection phase the main objective is maximizing the profit net present value and reducing net present investment and we should select the best concept therefore you need more accurate cost estimation and assessment methodology so what is design basis document design basis document is actually first document to be issued in the early concept screening and concept selection phase this document provides the framework and constraint within which the development team must operate as a minimum it should include reservoir characteristics and depletion plan including well count civil locations of the wells fluid characteristics or properties production profile enhanced recovery reservoir management and blah 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 and drilling and completion requirements like 
well locations rig specifications <coughs> and the site and the regional conditions such as water depth, meteor ocean data, seabed bathymetry which are used for concept design also we should make a functional requirements based on selected depletion scenarios actually functional requirements is usually a part of design basis document and it's not a separated document Functional requirement actually specifies design limits and constraints for surface facility team and help you to select proper systems or proper building blocks in the early stage of concept screening. For example, processing functionality and requirements can directly affect the required deck space and payload. A storage and export methods can directly affect hull type and geometry for example if the export method is pipeline then you sure that you don't need FPSO well axis motion for example if you know you have to have a direct vertical axis therefore probably you cannot use FPSO on semi submersible drilling and work cover with requirements which can make a constraint for motion and deck space and enhance recovery method again which, is, which can specify the required deck space to provide sufficient space for uh, facility and equipment required for enhanced recovery method like uh, water injection and gas injection but to rank and to compare scenarios with each other we need a ranking methodology and a strategy Ranking methodology and strategy can be categorized, for example, as quantitative or qualitative methods, deterministic or stochastic methods, and also it can be categorized based on the cost estimation accuracy and classes. Qualitative ranking method is usually used for uncountable parameters such as operability, constructability, installation ease, and so on. And it is used when less accuracy is required during ranking and comparison when you are in the concept screening phase and also it's usually used for technical issues but quantitative ranking is usually used for countable parameters such as cost time and schedule and it is used when we need more accuracy one of the countable parameters is economic factors and there are significant number of parameters which can fortunately be summarized by these three main parameters net present value net present investment and utility index which net present value is simply the net cash inflow minus net cash outflow subjected to discount rate which is a function of production profile fill life and sale price and also uh, capex opex and relics and net present investment is a sum of capex the relics and opex and abex and utility index which is a ratio between net present value and net present investment we should note that a stochastic analysis is usually required in early stage of the concept a screening and concept selection due to high uncertainty because you don't have a accurate cost estimation why because you has not defined your system and subsystems accurately you just know that you need this separation with this capacity to facilitate economic uh, calculation and cost estimation american association of cost engineering issued international recommendation practice on estimate classification they have defined five different cost classes where cost class 5 and cost class 4 are consequently used for concept screening and study and concept selection for cost class 5 the cost dispersion is between 100% to minus 50% and for cost class 4 cost dispersion is between 50% to minus 25% There are also several non-economic factors that drive an operator's decisions. 
which are construction period, operability, fabrication, reliability, and risk assessment. But these attributes here can be evaluated into two levels, attribute and sub-attribute level. Attribute level, which is more general uh, properties or characteristic is usually used for concept screening because you don't have so much detailed information about your concept but when your information is more matured uh, for your concept then you can evaluate or rank the concept at sub attribute level which is used at concept selection phase general general decision drivers during a uh, ranking strategy is minimizing technical risk, maximizing hydrocarbon recovery, constructability, schedule to first oil, expandability and flexibility to adapt to reserve or uncertainty. For example, expandability is one of the main characteristics of floating production system, especially when you are using floating production system with field with high uncertainty. For example, you have three twenty wells and you have planned for 40 uh, additional wells after some years of production but you are not sure you will do this uh, uh, additional wells or you will drill these additional wells or not before you finish this for example five years of production so therefore your facility should have sufficient space or sufficient capacity for additional risers Concept definition. You need concept definition both for concept screening and concept selection phases, but at different level. For concept screening, objective is to define all surface facility component to a level sufficient for class 5, capex, opex, and schedule estimation. In this regard, you can use available commercial softwares or databases like Olangas Manager, which is generated by Siemens, or in-house databases if you are a major oil company or major operator like as BP Schellenberger and you have a large databases from your previous project typical required inputs are basic subsea equipment like uh, flow lines manifold Christmas tree and risers number of wells the production profiles hydrocarbon sale price basic topside components and capacities type of host unit and required displacement then you can calculate net present value and net present investment and you compare different concepts based on utility index as a function of net present value and then you choose uh, only concept or scenarios which pass your net present value and utility index thresholds At concept definition phase, and I'm sorry, at concept selection phase, objective is to define all surface facility component to a level sufficient for cost class 4, capex, opex, and schedule estimation. In this regard, you need more detailed information about your concept, such as size of flue lines, risers, and pipeline, and determine even should determine arrival condition by simple flu assurance simulations you should speci specify top side drilling and work over equipments and make an initial layout by process simulation you make a process simulations and then you identify the size of your top side facilities through process flu diagrams and PNID and then you can make a weight estimation and cost estimation and even a schedule estimation make initial sizing of the hole to support topside riser and mooring weights now when you have a, a required deck space you have a topside weight and you have a required a storage then you can make a sizing of your hole and you can uh, make an initial riser and mooring design Perform stability and motion analysis to injure operability and survivability in extreme condition to design mooring and riser system. Make an execution plan for design, fabrication, integration and transportation, installation and commissioning, 
to estimate capex and schedule and now cost and schedule for each concepts will be estimated or will be calculated and you can compare and rank the scenarios and if even in this step you cannot make a final decision which is always a case you need also uh, make a risk assessment and then by putting all of this information together you can make a final decision and also you should validate your final decision by benchmarking against similar project in other part of the world as we mentioned risk assessment is one of the additional decision drivers a relative risk assessment will be performed including technical risk execution risk operational risk and commercial risk uh, please attention that we said relative risk assessment actually you don't need to calculate the risk accurately or quantitatively for each concept it's just a relative con comparison and sometimes it's also known as semi quantitative comparison what is tiebreakers sometimes it is difficult to make a final decision because it is not a straightforward decision based on part of the decisions you may end up with semi submersible solution and based on part of the decision you end up with FPSO solution what should you do now the final trick is tie breakers when economic and performance indicators of two concepts are indistinguishable an operator's tie breaker will be used which are actually a strategy of operator against HSE flexibility and mobility as an example when you have two concept that concept uh, in the uh, f um, uh, came out from the final decision gate concepts with larger deck give greater separation between hazardous and non-hazardous area therefore you can select this concept or if you are working with highly uncertain field then concepts which has better flexibility for future expansion might be a better solution or when you are working with a marginal field which has a let's say a field life of seven eight years definitely your surface facility life cycle will be larger and it is much more uh, cost benefit for you to use your surface facility for another project and you need to relocate it therefore you should select a concept which is easy for reloc relocation like semi submersible or fpso rather than tlp and spar after basic uh, after uh, preparing design basis documents and functional requirements you should generate different development scenarios based on basic building blocks a deep water facility development scenario can be constructed from the following building blocks according to functional requirements actually that functional requirements help you to identify what are the basic building blocks required for concept screening these basic building blocks or building blocks are subsea system enhanced recovery drilling platforms production platform export system and onshore facility which different uh, variations of these uh, basic building blocks are shown in this table here now we will explain each of these building blocks one by one the first one is subsea system a subsea system as you can see also on this uh, figure on the right consists of an assemblage of tree and wellhead manifold jumpers umbilic holes flue lines pipeline in manif uh, end terminations and there are two main basic building blocks for subsea systems one is single well tieback like what you see here and the other one multiple wells manifold tie back so you have for example two wells here just manifolded here and then 
tie back to the floating production unit through this riser. Subsea architecture is mainly driven or design of subsea structure is mainly driven by number of wells, location of wells, distance to the host platform, field properties to determine the flue line dimensions and arrival production rate temperature and pressure at pipeline and manifold. Another building block is enhanced recovery. Sometimes to extend field life or for production optimization you need enhanced recovery, secondary or tertiary recovery methods. Basic building blocks are downhole boosting, gas lift, gas injection, water injection and secondary and enhanced recovery methods like steam flooding, fire flooding, chemical injection, polymer injection if you have a field with low permeability and high viscosity oil. Another building block is drilling platform. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that maybe the influence of enhanced recovery is not as much as previous building blocks on the concept selection. But you still, for some of these uh, enhanced recovery method, you still need to consider some deck space and uh, some payload like uh, water injection and gas injection that require some compressors and pumps. Another building block is drilling platform which depends on drilling, work cover and well intervention requirements of your field. Depending on the size of the reservoir and type and distance of the well from the floating production unit. In order to provide drilling and work cover functional requirements, you may need to use one of these solutions or one of these basic building blocks, tender assisted drilling rig, mobile offshore drilling rig and permanent drilling platform. As an example, on, at the left side, you can see a field with satellite well system and subsea wells. Therefore, you need mobile offshore drilling unit or drill ship to give drilling and work cover service to this field, which might be the most expensive solution. But when you have a single drill center and surface well, such as this uh, tension leg platform here, this TLP, then because all of your wells are in the same location of, as your platform, you can have a direct vertical access and then solution might be a tender assisted drilling rig or drilling platform I mean floating production platform with full drilling package these are all um, three exa uh, examples of all three solutions mobile offshore drilling unit like Amir Kabir semi-submersible which is a, a drilling platform in Caspian Sea which is used for wet tree system satellite well and heavy heavy work cover but actually this uh, mobile offshore drilling unit is doing the exploration drilling at the moment. The other one is tender assisted drilling. This is when you have a dry tree system, well cluster and you need heavy work cover but because of type of your, of your platform which is here TLP you have a payload limit and you cannot put full drilling package on your floating platform and also using mobile offshore drilling unit is not cost effective solution therefore you put just drill and some of primary equipment for drilling and work cover on your floating production unit and you use another service vessel which carries like mud pump and other equipment requires for drilling service and when you have a you need a drilling service you ask this vessel coming and just uh, uh, berth beside you and you can uh, perform all the drilling service required. The other solution is full drilling package on floating production unit. When you have a dry tree system, well cluster, drilling and work cover system is required and you have sufficiently large floating production unit like TLP Mars in Gulf of Mexico.
We can make a simple guideline for early decision on key platform functions, as you can see here. So, for example, from this guideline, if you have a, a small field with a single drilling center and with vetry, which can be usually the most cost effective solution, then it is economic solution or cost effective solution to only have production unit without drilling and work hour because you don't need frequent drilling and work hour service and if you use another mobile offshore drilling unit to give you this such a services then it, it can be a much better solution or if you have a multiple sub economic uh, sub economic reservoirs with multiple well system with vetry again production is sufficient but if you have a large a stack or compact reservoirs which you can have a single drill center I mean a well cluster system and dry tree then because probably you have too many number of wells because you have a large a stacked or compact and you probably need frequently drilling services therefore it's more cost effective to have a full drilling package on your floating production unit but what are different type of host platform so here in this picture you can see different variety of these floating production systems host platforms actually compose of uh, these subsystem topside hole station keeping system and riser system your host platform um, can support drilling and work cover or drilling and work cover can be included in your uh, host platform or it can only um, I mean the floating production unit can only uh, combine with work cover or without drilling and work cover I mean based on your field requirement floating production unit can be combined with drilling and work cover only work cover or without drilling and work cover these are four different type of floating production units number four is semi-submersible number five oh, I'm sorry number four and five are two different varieties of uh, tension lake platforms because here you can see the mooring lines which are connected floating production unit to the seabed are under tension but here these mooring lines are catenary and it is known as a spar and number seven and number eight are semi submersibles and number nine is floating production storage and offloading which is actually a shuttle tanker that uh, equipped with a topside facilities for production but what are the fundamental differences between the floating platforms is it actually the uh, outer geometry is a fun fundamental differences we can say no the fundamental differences between the floating platform is mainly associated to drilling and work cover capacities some platform doesn't have enough capacity to support a full drilling package ability for dry tree or wet tree support some platform cannot carry dry tree system like semi-submersible because they have large motions and with dry tree system you need direct vertical access and thereby vertical top tension risers which in a semi-submersible case you will get um, too large heave motion which can cause uh, big fatigue damage to the risers a storage capacity not all the floating production unit have a, enough storage capacity for export purpose scalability scalability to water depth and payload some of the floating production unit can only be used up to some water depth like TLP which the sol available solution only approved up to 1500 meters because beyond that water depth uh, the tethers which are the vertical tension pipes will be too heavy and not cost effective heave and pitch motion some of uh, platforms has too much heave and pitch motions 
which are not suitable for uh, some uh, regions and some of platforms have limited even pitch motion like TLP and execution risk regarding construction, installation, operation, abandonment and reuse for example when you select the floating production unit because of your schedule maybe you cannot exceed three years for execution then if you select floating production unit which needs based on experience needs more than three years then you should cross it from your solutions comparison of different floating production units here we have a simple table which shows different variants of floating production units their main functionalities which we mentioned earlier and can be used to select initial building blocks is there any constraints regarding water depths and topside payloads and how easy or how difficult is offshore installation integration commissioning decommissioning relocation and flexibilities after you produce uh, oil and gas you need to export it to the market export system is another building block selection of export method depends on distance to the market distance to the available infrastructure and pipeline a storage capacity of host platform field life and neighboring fields for example when you have a your market far from you for example you are producing oil offshore Brazil but your market is China then there is definitely not a good solution to use pipeline so then you should directly go to shuttle tanker offloading system and possible methods are oil and gas pipeline direct shuttle tanker offloading no on-site storage that means but this is a very it has a limited applications when you have a floating production unit without a storage capacity you can assign enough number of shuttle tankers to the floating production unit and a schedule offloading such that you can continuously uh, produce uh, your oil to shuttle tankers and when shuttle tanker is like let's say 90% full you can connect second shuttle tanker to the other offloading sector and start offloading from that one shuttle tanker offloading with floating pro uh, storage unit or FPSO so if you have a floating production unit with sufficient storage capacity then you can you assign or uh, lease sufficient number of shuttle tankers to offload from your floating production unit with shuttle tankers and then you can schedule uh, offloading and you know that for example every two weeks you need a shuttle tanker with this capacity at site to offload the produce oil during these uh, two weeks and also if you have a gas field or even you, if you have associated gas with your uh, oil and you need to export your gas if a pipeline is uh, not possible the other solution is less liquid natural gas or LNG carriers which is uh, used with FLNG flo floating liquefied natural gas uh, producer onshore facilities uh, sometimes to reduce capex and opex you might need to uh, put some of your services to onshore for example you can have a tank farm and loading terminal beside your offshore facility because it's much more cost effective to um, just uh, store your produce oil onshore than offshore LNG plant for example gas to liquid plant and gas to wire plant are other alternatives okay now we are ready to start our example which is a simplified concept a screening and concept selection and through this example we will explain more detail about concept screening and concept selection so our case study is a gas field let's assume that we are at the end of exploration and appraisal phase and 
concept screening workshop has been held and this is a field development concept matrix as an output from this workshop so these are uh, building blocks and different alternatives in each building blocks if you multiply all of these uh, building blocks to each other initial number of scenarios will be 128 but definitely all of these scenarios will not be I'm sorry technically feasible so after technical feasibility for example if you have a gas with FLNG then export cannot be pipeline or if you have a semi submersible then direct vertical access will, will not be possible so here we assume that we have done first um, a stage of technical feasibility and we end up with uh, 12 different scenarios which includes four subsea well systems four six eight and ten and three host platform tieback jacket and semi-submersible but please note that here we have considered the subsea solution as a platform but this is not known as a platform we just call it subsea or subsea production system okay so these are our three solutions and four uh, different number of wells now with the available databases or commercial databases we can make a net present value net present investment estimation or calculation from our revenue and uh, uh, I'm sorry uh, we can uh, calculate net present investment from total cost capex drillx opex and abex which include cost of infrastructure, drilling, operation, and abandonment. So, let's assume that these are in million dollars, uh, net present investment in million dollars, and net present value is calculated from hydrocarbon sale price and production profile with 50% confidence for different number of wells. And now, you have net present value and utility index for each concept and each number of wells and you plot them in such a graph utility index vertical axis and net present value horizontal axis so this is result for fixed platform this is result for semi submersible and this is result for tieback solution so here we haven't defined any threshold for utility index and net present value so for example your minimum net present value might be here so then automatically fixed platform will be crossed from solution if your net present value margin is for example here or your minimum utility index would be here but we don't have uh, such a margin so when we don't have such a margin we have to select concept which maximize net present value and utility index simultaneously for example for fixed platform six wells for semi-submersible six wells but for tieback it's difficult to decide because with six wells we have maximized net present value and with four wells we maximize utility index but it's a wise decision to use a solution with six wells or to go forward with solution with six wells because in case of four wells if your field is uh, there is high uncertainty in your field and you lose one well then you lose 25 percent of production but as we mentioned earlier in net uh, in concept screening phase there is high uncertainty in our estimation and therefore we should make a relative comparison between the reliability of the result for each concept or also to evaluate the sensitivity of the result to the uncertainties which is done usually by Monte Carlo simulation so as you can hear there is high uncertainty in the cost estimation which need to be captured by Monte Carlo simulation for net present value and net present investment but how we do that as you can hear as you can see here for each cost parameter 
you can define in the um, early stage I mean in concept screen you cannot make a single value you have to define some ranges for each cost parameters so let's assume that these are minimum mean value and maximum for each cost parameter and then you assign a triangular distribution for each cost parameter probability density function I mean and you calculate cumulative distribution function for each cost parameter and then you make a Monte Carlo simulation by generating a white noise the white noise is just a population of numbers between 0 to 1 and then for this population and for each cost parameter and using cumulative distribution function you calculate the population of each of these cost parameters and for each um, cost para or for uh, each population or better to say for each sample of each uh, cost uh, number cost parameter you calculate net present value which give you a population of net present value and you can calculate cumulative distribution function of net present value for each case which which is here number of wells and if you look at you, this um, diagram here tells you two important uh, points or facts one which number is more reliable here so you can see uh, net present value associated to 12, 10 wells always have a higher accumulation probability than other number of wells therefore so calculation for 10 wells is more reliable and reliability is, redu is reduced by number of wells and what is the best design value and usually we take the median value from this, this uh, graph I mean we take the value associated to 50% probability which are these values so this calculation we have done up to now is only realized on economical indices but what happens if we also include non-economical indices such as a schedule to first oil for example in the, our previous calculation here or here we have assumed that a schedule to first oil I mean the duration from sanction of construction of platform up to a start up is three years for all each concept but actually it's wrong if we want to be more accurate semi submersible usually takes longer time to construct than fixed platform and tieback so if we assume three years for tieback and fixed platform we should assume five years for semi-submersible and then if we include these a schedule to first order in net present value calculation suddenly semi-submersible will shift to the left side it can completely change our decision therefore it is important to include non-economic parameters so economic evaluation alone is not sufficient for final decision concept selection now we will explain some activities during concept selection for both in concept selection and concept a screening we need qualitative comparison but for concept selection comparison should be uh, performed up to sub attribute levels actually we don't explain the uh, qualitative comparison here for concept screening phase because it's quite similar and much simpler than uh, qualitative comparison in uh, concept selection phase the standard method which is usually used uh, for qualitative comparison when you have multiple scenarios with multiple attributes is analytical hierarchy process which is a this uh, which is a decision making which is decision making method to prioritize concept under qualitative multiple attribute decision drivers 
This is the typical procedure. First, you select list of attributes and sub attributes which make a difference between all concept. And then you specify the relative importance of attributes and sub attributes with a proper weighting system. I mean, you should prioritize one attribute to other attributes. Which one is more important for your exploration and exploitation? And then you rank your scenarios for each sub attribute and you calculate the final decision parameter, which can be used for comparing scenarios. Here we show, uh, we show an example of attribute and sub attributes, but how we select attributes and sub attributes for concept selection. As you can see here, selection of attributes and sub attributes are performed with a brainstorming multidisciplinary workshop. I mean, representative from drilling, subsea systems, flow assurance, pipeline, and uh, floating system and processors. Usually, the head of each of these disciplines are coming to this uh, workshop, and then they will define these attributes and sub-attributes, like attributes, uh, some examples of attributes are operability, fabrication, installation, time to first full and production, cost, and reliability, and these are associated sub-attributes. After that, you need to prioritize these attributes or weight these attributes with the proper weighting system because attributes are not usually equally important. Therefore, we need to assign a weight factor according to the importance in exploitation systems. This is a typical standard weighting system. For example, you take attribute A and attribute B and compare them together. If attribute A is absolutely more important than attribute B, then weight of 9 should be assigned to attribute A and vice versa attribute B will be automatically absolutely less important than attribute A and associated weight will be 1 over 9 and then you make a pairwise comparison for all of the attributes which you will end up with such a table make a pairwise comparison and weight the attributes and after you weight all of these attributes, you normalize these numbers and you end up with this number here. What you should do here, first you make a table, for example in Excel worksheet, in the first column and first row, name just name these attributes and then make a pairwise comparison. So you ask yourself or team, uh, which one is more important, operability or, or fabrication? So operability is much more important, 5 and therefore fabrication will be 1 over 5 more important than operability and then you uh, sum all of these columns 1, 2, 3, 4, these 4 numbers for each column and then you divide each of these 4 numbers with this uh, summation which actually you normalize these 4 numbers here with this number like here and then you sum each of these rows uh, for each attribute or sub-attribute and you end up with this number which is a weight of each attribute which shows the relative importance of each attribute you will make the same uh, uh, weight assignment for sub-attribute as well and now you should rank field development concept with this ranking system excellent, good, average and poor 1, 2, 3, 4 for each sub attributes so you ask the team how good is tieback solution regarding ease to start up or shut down is it excellent is it good is it average is it poor okay the average decision from the team is good three and then you perform this ranking for all of the concepts and for all of the sub uh, attributes and now you multiply each factor here to weight of sub attribute to weight of attribute and you put it here and then for next number and for next one and if you sum all of these column here 
the number you get is multi attribute decision making value or result for each of these concepts but for multi attribute decision making analysis or model usually engineering judgment is used to define the attributes and weights so human is one of the most uncertain thing or phenomenon in the world and this can vary depending on the experience of the people time frame and available information and it is obvious that if you even same the uh, same use team uh, use same team for assigning and defining these sub attributes and weighting system and use them 10 years later their experience their information is different and even at the same time at different location if you perform this uh, workshop in shell for example or in bp people have different experience and you will get different weighting system but not that much but you have to study effect of uncertainty in your result again you make a same uh, Monte Carlo simulation you have done for net present value for each uh, attributes uh, the weighting value you have calculated is not a single value it can be a range of value because you have asked several people in the workshop each people has gave you one number and then for example you had 10 people and from these 10 people you can calculate the lower value base case and upper value and then after you have these three number you assign a triangular distribution generate white noise or a sample of uh, population of uh, 0 to 1 and then you calculate the population for uh, weight of these each, va each values from this uh, population of value from 0 to 1 and now you make a multi attribute decision making model calculation again for each sample which you give you a population for multi attribute decision making model for each concept and this is the final result and you calculate cumulative distribution function for MDM all right but now let's look at the result after a stochastic analysis so this table here shows the range of MDM value for each concept and probabilities as you can see the range of MDM value for example for fixed platform it's probably from here to here so usually fixed platform give you larger MV MDM than tieback On the other hand, if you look at here, the result for tieback has higher probability. Why? Because if you just make a vertical line from here for the same MDM, the cumulative probability of tieback is higher than semi sub and fixed platform. And from this uh, graph, it is obvious that jacket gives the highest MDM for the same frequency so if you use the same frequency like here cumulative probability here the value you get for jacket is 3 let's say 3.32 which is much higher than 3.22 much higher than 3.08 And in order to evaluate the, or uh, to evaluate the effect of uncertainty, you calculate the median value of all three concepts, which is associated to the first three persons, and you compare these with the previous deterministic calculations. But these numbers are quite similar to the numbers we have calculated in the uh, previous deterministic, cal deterministic calculation. Therefore, this stochastic analysis confirms the deterministic results.
great. But if we look at the final decisions based on economic indices and based on non-economic indices during concept screening, during concept screening, economic indices tell, told us tie back is the best plat, uh, solution, then semi sub, then jacket. But during concept selection, none of the economic indices told us jacket, semi submersible, and tie back. So it's not a straightforward to make a final decision now. We need risk assessment. Risk assessment. To finalize the result from concept selection, risk assessment should be performed. Risk is usually defined probability of is a, a product of probability of occurrence times severity of consequences. The procedure for risk assessment. First, make a list of all possible risk events based on previous records or records of failures or based on failure mode and effect analysis. Then we should determine the probability of occurrence for each failure event or failure mode. And also we should specify the attributes which will be affected by risk event like health and safety, environment, asset value and project schedule. And we should calculate the impact severity of risk events on attributes for each concept. And finally, calculate the total risk associated to each concept. And we will explain this uh, procedure in main, deta main uh, detail here. In more detail, I'm sorry, here. So first, let's assume that we have, uh, we have made a workshop and expert in each discipline has made a list of risk events for us. And now we want to assign probability of occurrence to each risk event. We usually use the value between 1 to 5, which means less, uh, this is least frequent and this is most frequent uh, number of occurrence. So for qualitative probability assignment, risk taker are divided into two groups, aggressive risk taker and conservative risk takers. What does it mean? That means when you ask two group of people, group of designers and group of operator, and you ask them how frequently this failure mode is happening so both group give you same number three but three from um, operators are have more meaning or better to say the three uh, from operators means uh, more frequent than three from designers so therefore, you, you uh, consider designers as conservative risk takers and operators as aggressive risk takers. So then from 3, you will use uh, the number given by the operators will be associated to something around 15 and number given by the uh, designers will be around 30. And now we should evaluate the impact severity of risk events on attributes. So here you have a risk attributes which are affected by risk events and this is the consequence levels on each attribute. So if we call it exponential for health and safety, if it leads to fatalities, serious impact on public. And actually impact severity appraisal is also weighted by the same factoring curve 
as we had here because again uh, uh, impact severity you should ask people so what is the impact impact severity of uh, for example offloading failure on environment designer might say exponential designer might say significant three but operator might say exponential and then you factor these five and three based on their group of risk taker with the previous graph anyway what you finally end up is this risk calculation table so here you have a list of all of risk events their probability of occurrence and the weight factors and here you have list of attributes which are affected by these risk events and their relative importance which here for us they are um, we have considered they are uh, their importance is equal so 0 25 is assigned to all four and here is the impact severity for all four attributes or five four attributes yes and this is after factoring and if you just multiplied this factor uh, um, factored value of the environment to the factor value or the weighted or factor value of the risk event 36 times 4 times 0 to 25 put it here and then 7 times uh, 36 times 0 0.25 and you put the you put it here yes yes and then if you calculate a square root of these four numbers here you will end up with this number which the sum of all of these numbers will be risk weight No, I'm sorry, it's not a square root, it's actually a square sum. You just sum these four numbers together and then you uh, calculate the uh, a square root of, uh, it's not a mean square, a square root of sum of the numbers. I'm sorry, just uh, note that this is uh, it's not correct here. You just uh, sum this number together, these four numbers, and then you calculate the second root of some of these numbers okay now we have net present value multi-attribute decision making model and risk weight three factors to make a final decision the result from risk assessment can be combined with multi-attribute decision model and net present value calculation for final selection so here is three of our options tieback, fixed platform and semi-submersible and here is risk weight, associated risk weight and MDM so if we plot MDM as a function of risk weight and net present value as a function of risk weight so from this table we should select concept which minimize risk and maximize MDM but this concept minimize risk this one maximize MDM it's not possible to make a decision here let's go here concepts which maximize net present value and minimize risk will be the final concept it's easy tie back so as you see here even at the end of concept selection phase it's not easy sometimes to make a final decision but this is just a simplified quite simplified example just to show the uh, general flow of information and calculations and to show some of the challenges in the concept screening and concept selection 
and here you need to use uh, tie breakers or operators strategies to make a final decision now well let's make a conclusion about this presentation based on this presentation we found that concept selection for deep water field development planning is a multidisciplinary task and need contribution from all of the stakeholders like subsurface drilling and completion subsurface facility operation and maintenance management and commercial team and you need a structure methodology to generate a screen and select the right development concept and concept selection is usually performed when the uncertainty in the critical parameters which determine the commercial success of the project is high and addressing subsurface data uncertainty in the facility design phase is also important deep water facility design is highly dependent on subsurface data not only on water depth and meteor ocean data which probably most of the naval architecture who don't have enough information about subsurface they just assume that or even I when I was a master student at university I've never learned anything about subsurface and when I left university I thought okay concept selection is only based on water depth and meteor ocean data while well, now I'm sure it's less than 25 percent of the effect comes from these two parameters success of field development planning highly depends on quality of information skills of subsurface team technology and reservoir modeling and this is a list of references that you can find almost all the information I presented during this lecture to you and all of them are uh, available online so don't worry about that and I would like to acknowledge again Professor Milan Stocco and Michael, uh, Professor Michael Gulan who gave me this opportunity to uh, come to your department Department of Petroleum Engineering and give you this lecture thank you very much have a nice day